Uh, so I think you can. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much for joining our talk. Um, before we start, so just, just a quick uh, introduction what we're going to do. So we're going to have a, um, a quick look at how to troubleshoot deployments. We have structured this talk to be in two parts. The first part is going to be we're going to have a look at a little bit of a theory behind deployments. And the second part, we're actually going to break and fix stuff. So we're going to have two teams, team A and team B. So if you're sitting on this side of the room and you want to join team B, now it is the time. Okay? Yeah. And then, yeah, team B, please. Invite, invite your friends to join you for the ultimate match. That's it. Um, without further ado, then Madvi is going to start our talk. And thank you very much for, for joining us. Okay. Now, we're going back to team B, or team A. Okay, welcome to our talk. I'm Madhvi. I'm a solutions architect at Dell Technologies. And I'm joined by Dan, Daniel, at LearnK8. He, if you are interested in following everything about Kubernetes, well-researched articles, please follow Dan. Thank you. So this is something that we're going to do. So I guess now, since there is no shifting, so we are going to debug and you know, deep dive into this particular picture. Okay. Kubernetes embraces the idea of you know, treating servers as one single unit, right? abstracting away how individual computer resources operate. And for, you know, from a multiple clusters, multiple servers, it makes it look like it has one single server, single cluster, right? Imagine over here, like, you have three servers, and you can install Kubernetes control plane on one, and the rest of them, the remaining two, can join as worker nodes. And Kubernetes abstracts over here, making it look like a single unit, and you're accessing it from one single cluster. If you want to deploy a container, Kubernetes finds the best place for you and deploy it. Now, that goes for many containers over here like this. But in reality, what's happening is it is finding a best suited place for you to which worker node suits the requirement of your container and deploys it over here. Now that we understood how Kubernetes work, we will see how the deployment actually takes place in Kubernetes. Now imagine you have a simple static page like this. right? You can have your users visit this page even without Kubernetes. Right? If you have more than one instance, how are you going to route the traffic to those instances? Team A or Team B? Yeah, who knows the answer? Very Don't good. balancer, Team A. Awesome. Bing. One point. Yeah. So you use a load balancer to route the traffic. Now, what happens if you have more than one app? You use another load balancer. Now, to route the traffic to both these load balancers, what do you need? Another load balancer or a router which routes the traffic to the right application. Now, in Kubernetes, you don't call the load balancer load balancer, but you call it as service. And you call the router or the load balancer is called as ingress. And the instances that are receiving traffic, you call it as pods. Now, ingress, service, and pods are fundamental concepts in Kubernetes. But there is something that is invisible over here. That is deployment. We don't actually deploy pods in isolation, but we do it in, together as an abstraction called deployment. Now, in this picture, you see that we see ingress, service, and three pods running. What you don't see is this is a deployment. Uh, what is a deployment? Right? It is a single type of pod that you want to run, and you want to mention how many such instances that you want to run. As simple. Now, this is how the Kubernetes takes, place of, takes care of it. 
the deployment checks how many instances you want to run and creates that many instances. In case a pod is deleted accidentally, it will create a new one. Now, we will see how a request is going through the Kubernetes cluster. The journey begins with kubectl apply command. Now, who is listening there? The first component that is listening is the API server. Now, the API server is talking to etcd, who is the single source of truth over here. Now, this is a big pipeline by itself. Now, if we want to take a look, I want to remember what API server is, there are three A's that I want to take away from this slide. Authentication, you say who you are, you prove it. Authorization, what kind of permissions do you have to the cluster? And the admission controllers. In the admission controllers, we have two types, that is mutation and validation. In the mutation admission controller, it modifies the request based on some custom logic. And validation admission controller will basically validate the spec and you know, pass it on to the etcd. Now, we're going to get to the second step of the life cycle. Now, the API server, now we remember that everything is stateless in Kubernetes except for the etcd, right? Now, the API server gets the request and passes to the etcd, where we now have the request for a deployment. There is somebody who is listening other than over here, a core component called as controller manager. Controller manager is a bundle of things, like everything like how we saw in API server. But in this context, there are two things that are very important in the controller manager. Controller manager is also subscribing to all the changes that are happening in the etcd. Now, the controller manager is, can be divided into two in this case. One is deployment controller and the replication controller. And who else is there? Now, once the controller manager creates these particular pods, it sees that you have asked for three pods to run. And it is listening. It creates the change. It passes the change in the etcd over here. And who is listening to this? It passes the change as pods are spending. And the scheduler comes into picture. Once the pods are pending, in pending state, the scheduler picks up. And it is the scheduler's job to assign where the pod should run. So basically, it queues over here. The scheduler picks up over here. And it kind of does two things which are very important. Those are filtering and scoring. What is filtering? It actually tries to figure out what nodes are actually fit enough to run the particular pod. And scoring is a way where it ranks which node can take it up. Now we go to further down the request and see what happens. Right. Now the scheduler has changed the state in the etcd as scheduled. Now by now, you think, is there a resource running? Anyone can say? No, not a single thing has happened. Everything that has happened is only in the database, and nothing has happened in, on the infrastructure side. Who is doing installing the pods or creating the pods? Who is taking care of it? The kubelet. Kubelet is a Kubernetes agent. Now remember, when we started, we created a control, control plane, and we had worker nodes. So kubelet runs on each worker node over here. Right. You see the work, kubelet on the worker node. Now, what does the kubelet do? Right. It continuously polls and checks if there is something for it to create in the worker node. Right. The kubelet's job is to see what it is there in the control plane, and then do this, get the uh, you know, polls the thing to the control plane, the request, receives the spec, and installs it in the node. 
So if Kubelet is doing that, what are these things? What are CNI, CRI, or CSI? These are just the binaries that are there on the worker nodes. You can do this even on your laptop or computer, right? Create a Docker. But why Kubelet? Kubelet is doing this automatically by subscribing to the control plane. Now, we come to, we say that, you know, deploy three replicas, and what's the Kube, Kube, sorry, Kubelet does? It goes and checks with the control plane, and then gets the pods back, then automatically passes it to the, which part of the CRI, CRI, CSI? It passes to the Docker daemon, in, in my case, but a container on time, right? And creates the container over there. Now, the rest of the kubelets that is there in the cluster, they act independently and create the containers accordingly. Now, let's see from the rolling updates point of view. You want to take over? Yeah, can do. So un until now, we had a look at how this deployment has been created. And a rather simple process turns out to be quite, quite complex, which involves several steps um, running, running in sequence. So let's have a look at something else which is, which is related to deployment, and that's rolling updates. So when we have a rolling update, so this is the infrastructure. I've got a cluster with three nodes and three applications deployed. What happens is we gradually roll out a new ver newer version of the application, and then we remove the previous one. Right? But how does that work in the context of Kubernetes and these controllers that we just um, described? Well, the way it works is you go on the command line, you type kubectl apply, and a version, an image version is changed. Simple enough, right? But that, what that translates to, that request goes to the API server. The, server, the API server will change that deployment resource. It will mark that resource as changed. What happens next? Who is listening for changes to deployments? Team A, team B, show me. Who is listening to changes? Controller manager. Yes, exactly. The controller manager notices that, you know, we asked for it, something has changed, so it's going to be receiving a new structure and say, oh, okay, you asked me for a rolling update, so what I'm going to do next, I'm going to create a new pod, and this pod is pending. Who is listening to changes for pending pods? Yes, scheduler is going to say, yes, I'm going to look at this pod, see if there is any space for it, and I'm going to sign a note to it. Done. It is scheduled. What happens next? Kubelet. I had the kubelet. Yes, the kubelet will pick up the work. It's going to ask the control plane, hey, is there anything for me? Yes, there is. There is a new pod for you. And then the kubelet will delegate creating the container to the, the container runtime, and eventually it's going to create the pod. Is this enough? No. What's next? Termination. Oh, yeah, termination. Yeah, before termination, before terminating the old pod, though, the kubelet will do something else. I mean, among other things. It will go and execute liveness and readiness probes. Okay. And then when the readiness probe is actually tick, then it will go back to the control plane and say, hey, all done. This, this, um, this pod is actually ready to receive traffic. Well, a little bit oversimplified, but that's the idea. And then it will go and say, the controller manager will say, okay, fair enough. Um, we've done the first one, that's when we terminate the pod, right? That's when we go down and we remove the previous pod, and then we've got only three pods running inside the cluster. Um, is it? What happens next? I just remove the pod inside etcd. The kubelet will pick up the work, right? So it's the kubelet who now is going to reconcile the state of the node with the state of the cluster. It will remove that pod from the node. Am I done? No, this is just step one or three, all right? So we go all over, all over again. We go on the control plane, we'll create a new one. It is pending. Who's going to pick up the work? Scheduler is going to make a market the scheduled. Who's going to pick up the work next? Kubelet, yes, well done. The kubelet will go and create the pod. What happens next? 
Liveness and readiness, yes, absolutely. We go back and report that to the control plane. What happens next? Delete the previous spot, yes. What happens next? Okay. <laughs> I know it's, it's getting confusing. The next is the Kubler. Kubler will delete. Controller manager will add a new one. It's pending. Who's next? Scheduler. Well, yes, exactly. It's scheduled. Then the Kubler will pick up the work, create, report back to the control plane after liveness and readiness, delete the old pod, and finally, done. Done. So you just change the version on your deployments, and then Kubernetes go through these steps right, to roll out the newer version of the container. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Well, the reality is that it, a lot of things could go wrong in this process, and then it's generally a little bit hard to debug where the problem came from. So generally, the, you know, the way, at least the model I, I have to think about this sort of structure is, if, you're, if I have to debug this very long process or any part of it, generally I start from the bottom. I go and check that my application is running, and then if that is running, then generally I look at interaction between what we call services, so these internal load balancers, and the pods. And then if that is working, then that's the hardest part, figuring out why the ingress isn't actually routing traffic from, from the top. Now, um, this is the plan, so we're gonna have a look at what is this. So basically, this diagram, which is, looks small, I was hoping to have, a, <laughs> I was hoping that the big screen will look bigger, but <laughs> this is the harsh reality that we live in. <laughs> um, so the first part is basically, we're gonna have a look at what kind of things we have to do to actually inspect the application and see why it is broken or isn't it coming up correctly. A second part is basically we have a look at why this ingress, why this service isn't routing the traffic to, um, to our pods. And then the third one is, okay, how do I actually route traffic from the outside and why is that isn't, isn't happening at all? Okay. And I thought the best way to do this was to break something and fix it, right? And then we can have a look together. Okay. So. So I'm running, <laughs> it goes without saying that the, I'm running a cluster locally, um, the Wi-Fi doesn't let me use SSH, and it's not very good at downloading either, so we're gonna have some fun. Um, so first of all, I'll show you what, what the end result, ooh, what the end result looks like, so we can start with that. So I applied some, some YAML, and um, so this is an application, so you don't, you don't know much right now. I just basically type some magic commands and then things happen on the screen, fair enough. And, but the end result is, if I visit a URL, that's basically when I see the application running. Okay, let me just delete that and then <laughs> see, we do it again, but this time. Okay, so what I've done right now, I just submitted a YAML file and then I've got a pod running in my cluster. And then it is the same, it is, a, you know, it is the same application, if I go to, to this URL, then I need to refresh, it should work, but it doesn't. This is more or less the experience that you as a developer, you will face when you deploy something or, you know, your colleagues deploy something. They get a 503, come back to you and say, hey, it isn't working. What should I do next? So what do you do? What's your advice here? Um, you know, I've got a cluster, I've got some kubectl commands. What's your first command? Yeah, go for it. That's a, that's a, actually, that's a good, that's a good um, idea. So first of all, it's showing an Nginx error. So is that a problem with the Nginx? So what are you doing right now is you're basically debugging a layer three, right? So while I, I think you are on the right mindset, I think the, the issue that we find is that this area at the top, it is very hard to debug, okay? So you might be right, and the error is actually inside the ingress, but before we reach that point, our suggestion is, okay, let's go in and start from the bottom before we move up to the ingress, right? Okay. 
So tell me, what I should do next? Cube, ca well, cube cattle, get pods. Whoa. Whoa, what is that? Check the log. Someone is saying check the log. Yeah, let's do it. You can do a describe. Let's do a describe. Okay. Describe person. Is this enough? No. What else do you want? Okay, I'm going to go for the logs. Whoa. It's an application, very well done. It's an application error. So at this point, you know, we started with, it must be Nginx, I see an Nginx string, and then we inspect the log, we start from the bottom, it's actually an application error, right? So this is actually saying, okay, we are missing some stuff in our YAML, it's time to go back and fix it before we can move on. So I can, um, so this is, um, this is the YAML file, so this is the description of the deployment that I just created inside. Um, inside the cluster, and, and this is the deployment, and you can see that there is no environment variable in this container. But if I go back to the page, if I go back to the terminal, this is suggesting that something should be set to actually make it work. So let's fix this. I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna tell you straight away. I'm just gonna copy, copy from the solution. Otherwise, okay. Okay, and, and then I'm gonna apply the changes. Okay, I can see it running. Looks like running. Let me go and refresh the web page. It is running right now. Okay, cool, fixed, done. Okay, I got more time for more. <laughs> um, so I think, I think, you know, the important lesson from this demo is that if if there is something, then even if it looks like coming from the network, it's much easier if you start from the bottom and then you, you level up. Okay, let's move to, to more interesting stuff. Let me just check. Uh, yeah, so generally what we've done, oops. I'm gonna reveal a little bit too much now. Okay, so we got, a, I deployed another application and this time, um, it's running. Let me just check what kind of uh, resources it's gonna create. This one should be running. And it's a 502 backend gateway again. Okay, what do I do? How do I debug this? I'm supposed to see a page saying hello world. <laughs> you wanna see the YAML? Well done, I agree with you. Okay, so this is the YAML that this application, let me just hide this. This is the YAML, the application we're working with. It's got some generic container image, which is basically just a hello world. Then it's got service, and it's got an ingress. Yeah. Do you spot any, I know I, let me see if I can do a split screen, all of it in, at once. That would be like, yeah. yeah. This is already revealing some of the issues. Can you spot the issue? Node port. Okay, getting closer. Any issue? Ports and the type. What ports, what type? 8080. What should it be? Should, should, what 8080 what should it be? <laughs> Ingress port is, okay, why? What, what should that be? Okay. Okay, I, think, I, know, I know it's very hard, you know, you come to a talk expecting to have a good time, and I just dump a bunch of YAML on the screen, say, fix this, please, now. 
Okay. <laughs> I, know, I know it's very hard, but there are a couple of things here that are a little bit fishy. Um, so, so generally, that we do, again, I think, you know, when you look at this, it's very complicated. And again, you know, it's a little bit unfair for me to show you and ask you to fix. But the way we debug this is exactly like we did with the previous example. Yes, we know it's, the problem is probably something with Nginx, but what if it is before that? So what we do first is we go back and we check the status of, of the pod. Is it running? Is it healthy? And the answer this time is yes. Okay. So now it is the time for us. We have a couple of things um, at our disposal here. But if the pod is running, then the other things I can do is I can connect to the pod. I can connect to the port which is actually exposed and then route the traffic to it and then see if it actually works. Right. So I can do kubectl port forward, and then the ID of the pod, and then if I remember correctly, here is 8080. Um, let me just do, I think I've got my slides on 8080. <laughs> okay. Um, it isn't connecting at all. This is really telling me that whatever, whatever we are doing, the way we are attaching our services to the pod is wrong. Because on 8080, there is nothing. So I can do kubectl logs and then the pod. Do you notice anything fishy or different? It's, yes, it's listening to a different port. All right? There's no way this could work, so we need to go back and change that. So if I go back, so this is basically saying me that this should be changed to 98, 98, okay? Any other change that should follow this? I mean, I know I haven't explained, but maybe some of you have seen this in, in the past and know what else should be done. So someone is saying target port. Yes, you are absolutely right. 98, 98 should match, right? Okay, so this is good. Let me just, I, I wrote this two weeks ago and then I didn't touch it. So I, I actually don't remember if all of, all of it fixes my heart. <laughs> okay, let's see. Yes, that was the fix. Okay, so let's have a look at why that was the fix. So. So generally what we have is a container port which is described where the application is exposed. Then we have something called target port, port, and then we've got something else uh, on the ingress as well. But generally this target port and container port should stay together. Um, and then the port, so if you put 300 or 98, 98 like in this case, then they should stay together. And then the ingress should also match. Now this example didn't have this, this problem, but those are the most common ones you can find. Um, the other <laughs> so we've done demo, demo two as well. So the other things that um, I think is important to remember is that um, when we don't know, when, when there is a problem with the network, the other things that we generally can do, and we haven't done, or we could have done, is do a kubectl describe uh, service. Let me just get the services first. Uh, demo two. And then there is a line here saying endpoints. So endpoints, let me just go and break it. You can see the endpoints here is empty. So endpoints is a very convenient mechanism for us to check what kind of, um, what kind of, app, what kind of pods are going to receive traffic from the service. So if I had a look at it, at the, you know, if I were to go back in time and just check the service before doing, doing the fix, I would probably find it, find it empty. So how this endpoint created? So it turns out that when you have the kubelet that creates the container, attaches to the network, and attach any of the volumes, then what it will do is the kubelet at that point in time creates the containers, assign an IP address, and then reports that to the control plane. So the only one who knows the IP address 
of that container at the beginning is, is the kubelet. Then the kubelet will say, hey, control plane, this is the IP address I assigned to the pod. And this, this is reported back. And then if you were to look inside this control plane, now you see the IP addresses as well. So these IP addresses are usually called endpoints and are basically one of the most useful things you get, you get in Kubernetes. And they are basically updated every time you add a pod or remove a pod, the state of the cluster is updated as well. Oops. And, and services, services are basically, when, when you do a kubectl describe pod, you're basically just asking, hey, can you show me all of the, all of the endpoints that are related to this, uh, to this particular service? And you basically just call and collect those IP addresses. Um, so services, we call services basically just a list of endpoints because that's what, what they are. I wish I could do a demo three, but I'm really running out of time. <laughs> so if you, want, if you want, we can do it later. But now I think um, I'm, not, I'm not able to, sorry. So, so I just want to recap some of the stuff we've done, we've done today. Hopefully you enjoyed and, and you sort of get a feeling for how the debugging should be structured or how you can approach it uh, when you see something not working right. So I think the, what, I, what I suggest you remember is the first one is creating a pod is very, very simple for you, but it turns out that there are several components in sequence involved in creating this pod. And any of these processes could fail at any time, right? So, so essentially, uh, we, we are left with, with some magic incantation that just works and, and it's brilliant un until it's not anymore. And so if you find any of those issues, even if it looks like it's coming from the top, right, from networking, then usually it's so much easier if you start from the bottom and you, you, draw, you, know, you, you go up as, as you see, as you confirm that the application is, is working. Then we had a look at these matching ports, so how, what you should be checking, and then we had a look at endpoints. So these endpoints are so crucial that we use it for so many other things, and something very useful when it comes to debugging, just checking where they are propagated. I'm over time. I hope you enjoyed. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for joining our talk. Cool. I don't know if there is any questions or anything. I'm, I'm conscious about time. Any questions? Or if you got any questions, you'll find me <laughs> just outside. Thank you.